in Cochise County in southeastern Arizona, just 59 miles from the border of Mexico. There lives a cowboy, a poet. And at the end of the day, when he heads back to get together with his friends, everybody has a real good time. You got a poem for us you're going to do tonight, sure. Baxter? Okay. It's I've, all yours. Uh, thank you. I picked one that I thought might be appropriate because a lot of folks figured that uh, those of us in the cow business kind of lead an idyllic life. Mm -hmm. But there are occasions when either always even people like us get down to no keys. And I wrote one when I was really down. Okay. Wrote it during Christmas, called All I Want for Christmas. <laughs> all my clothes are laundry. All my socks are full of holes. I've got TP in my hat band and cardboard in my soles. I've stuffed the wanted section underneath my long john shirt and my jacket's held together by dehorning blood and dirt. <laughs> and the leather on my bridle been fixed so many times my horse looks like that fence post where we hang the baler twine. <laughs> I've been unable lately to invest in purebred cows since my ex-wives and their lawyers are dependents of mine now. <laughs> See, my first wife took my saddle, and the second skinned my hide, and the third one got my deer head, and the last one took my pride. <laughs> I've had a run of bad luck, but I think it's gonna peak, cause my dog that used to bite me got run over just last week. <laughs> So all I want for Christmas is whatever you can leave, but I'd settle for a new wife who would stay through New Year's Eve. <laughs> That's marvelous. That's marvelous. <laughs> That's marvelous. That says it all. Down to no keys. Down to no keys. Well, the farmers are still out there at it, by guys just like they always have been. And still borrowing money, of course. <laughs> but it's not all work and no play for farmers. They have pastimes and hobbies. I guess the one that comes to mind, if I had to pick a national sport for farmers, would be the tractor pull. <laughs> um, not a real complicated game. Uh, <laughs> One that has evolved and changed very little from who can drag a rock the farthest. <laughs> I mean, it all began when Cro-Magnon Bob cleared the first field in Arco, Idaho. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, there are historical precedents as it's come down through the ages. Uh, the Egyptians, they were big rock draggers, weren't they? <laughs> Piled them places. And of course, I've always sort of felt like Easter Island was the site of an old tractor pull. <laughs> Maybe the Stonehenge. And of course, everyone knows about Plymouth Rock, <laughs> which of course was originally in Dodgeville, Wisconsin. <laughs> now the uh, cowboy equivalent of the tractor pull is the ranch rodeo. Uh, the whole premise behind it is who can move a large, ill-tempered, hooved, horned herbivore <laughs> and not get killed? <laughs> and of course, there are prehistoric roots in that too. You've seen the cave paintings, I'm sure, uh, where you have the stick cowboy standing on the edge of the stick cliff, <laughs> waving a red flag, and 12,000 stick buffalo <laughs> or stick mammoths are charging him. Well, all of them, I, I should say, both the tractor pull and the ranch rodeo, uh, are sort of modern ways of paying tribute to uh, skills that have been developed over the years. The ranch rodeo, the skills of roping and uh, uh, riding, um, cat cutting, calves and branding, things like that. Uh, and the tractor pull, I mean, skills that you still see, uh, tinkering. 
buying tools, <laughs> running to town for parts. <laughs> well, the premier event, though, in the ranch rodeo is an event they call the wild cow milking. <laughs> uh, to truly appreciate this event, you have to understand the mentality of the people who develop this sort of sport. <laughs> I call it the cowboy mentality, but in fact, you do not have to be wearing a hat and boots to possess this mentality. <laughs> it's best demonstrated by this joke. This is my idea of a cowboy joke. Bet you can't hit my hand before I move it. <laughs> is a rural land anymore. Uh, we've lost our down-home flavor and turned into connoisseurs. I admit that we drink Starbucks, but this I guarantee we still live down a dirt road, get her mail or empty. Got a blue-eyed dog, he likes Mountain Dew, but he likes his chicken corn on blue. Is that, is that rural enough for you? Well, he took me to the Opry where the fat girl sang real loud. And when the show was over, I applauded with a crowd. Now I can take Beethoven, Pavarotti now and then. But I like my classical music with yodel at the end. Yodel -o 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 I tasted vintage wine. Gourmet food, but I like my caviar barbecued. Is that, is that rural enough for you? Well, the truth is, we're not hayseeds, we just come from deeper roots. I remember Grandpa sitting in his Sunday polished boots, rocking me ma on the porch swing, just as cool as he could be. His arm around her shoulders. And a spit cup by his knee. I gigged the frog last night with my pocket knife. I licked it off and kissed my wife. Is that, is, is that, that rural enough for you? I got a pickup truck that is spanking new. Just me and the dog, but there's room for you. Is that, is that rural enough for you? I had a blue tick hound that died last fall. I had him stuffed, he's on the wall. Is that, is that rural enough for you? If there was justice on Earth, the John Deere 4020 would be in the U.S. Air and Space Museum along with Apollo 13 and the Wright Brothers' first plane. It bridged the gap, plowed the furrow, and led the charge that delivered agriculture from the old days to the new ways. The 4020 gave us a glimpse of how it could be done. As early as the 1950s, pontificating pundits and chicken littles were posting dire warnings that the world population explosion would lead to massive starvation. They promoted panic in the streets and sold a million books. But they did not know about the tremendous potential of the American farmer and the army of science and engineering that rode upon his back. If the university and private interest could find a way to improve a crop, the farmers could grow it. Lord Nelson had HMS Victory, Robert E. Lee had Traveler, Bill had Hillary, and the farmer had his 4020. John Deere engineers would talk about the power to weight ratio, breakaway remote couplings, the eight-speed power shift, wet inboard disc brakes, the quick couple three-point hitch, hydraulic pumps, and lumbar support. But farmers knew it as 95 nimble horsepower that yearned to leap into harness and pull its heart out for you. He rode into battle on that streamlined workhorse, leaving in his wake the bounty that to this day remains our country's greatest strength. We may have to import oil, steel, 
and lumber and ore and electronics and shoes and t-shirts and foreign cars, but America can feed itself. And so it is for the 4020 that ushered in and laid the foundation for modern agriculture as we know it. But their monument does not stand in the mall in Washington, D.C. Their proud history is not extolled in academic circles and no one gets a day off to pay tribute to their accomplishment. Rather, the 4020 is honored in coffee shops, in communities where farmers cleared the land, tamed the prairie, and built the town. It's saluted in parades, often shining like a fine lady in a green gown with yellow earrings between the 4-H float and the rodeo queens mounted on to a raj. And it's cherished in the boyhood memories of men's minds as a mechanical mentor, one that instilled in them the values of hard work, reliability, and the pride of a job well done. In its time, it taught many that nothing runs like a deer. It's still possible to see these grand old tractors in harness now and then, maybe towing a load, or parked at the edge of a field, cultivator at rest, engine still warm, waiting.